Okay, so just before the service starts, uh, we're going to teach another new song. It's called There Is One Gospel. It's one that Mark and I sang a few weeks ago, just before the service, um, and we played it during the offering. So it may be familiar to a few of you. Uh, we'll sing through verse one, and then once you've grasped it, just join in with us. It's called There Is One Gospel. together.
Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to be here. It's good to be together, uh, to worship God together. Uh, It's good uh, to have some visitors with us this morning. We trust that as we come together to worship, as we come uh, to celebrate the sacrament of baptism uh, later on in our service, uh, as you join with us this morning, uh, we all, in fact, will know uh, God's blessing uh, as we worship together uh, this morning. And do do please remember that we've continued the, the cup of tea after church. Uh, do join us for for tea and maybe a coffee. You can get coffee as well. You know, I often say join us for a wee cup of tea and a chat, but you can have coffee as well uh, and chat as well after our service. It'd be good to, to catch up uh, and chat to one another, fellowship together uh, in that time. Just a few uh, brief uh, announcements. Uh, obviously, there'd be... Uh, announced for a few weeks, but uh, just to remind you that Tots & Co. Uh, will not meet tomorrow, uh, and, and the Ladies Book Club, which was due to meet uh, tomorrow night, uh, won't meet either, um, due to uh, Her Late Majesty's funeral. Uh, Tots will, of course, resume uh, the following Monday, and the Ladies Book Club uh, has been rescheduled to Monday the 3rd of October uh, at 7.45 in the Church Hall, I'm sure. You're all maybe aware of that in the book club anyway. But, of course, if you want to come to the book club, uh, you've never been before, uh, do speak today and you will be made uh, most welcome. Craft and Crack will resume on Tuesday the 27th of September from 2.30 to 4 p.m. And, of course, all are welcome there too. And the Afternoon Club will resume on Tuesday the 11th of October at the same time, 2.30 till 4 in the church hall uh, in October. The, the speakers are coming from the Air Ambulance Charity, so it'll be worthwhile coming along there. Of course, you'll be most welcome to come uh, and to join uh, in the afternoon club as well. Isn't it great to, to start to get to announce everything starting to come back again uh, to some sense, some sense of normality, get all our organisations back up and running again. We come uh, to worship God as we come uh, to worship uh, this morning. I want to read just a few verses uh, from Psalm 103, uh, where David is worshiping. Uh, we see a great and wonderful uh, and excited David coming, and, and he exclaims, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, O my soul. May we be stirred this morning, like David, as we come to worship, worship God, that, that we will be uh, excited and exclaim like David and praise uh, like David uh, as we come before God in worship. We're going to sing uh, together. Um, there's two pieces, uh, so I'll say stand and sit as you, as you are able. Uh, if at the end of the first hymn you feel a wee bit tired, have a sit down. Uh, it's no less worship. It's all about our hearts. It doesn't matter whether we're standing or sitting. Let's, let's praise God uh, together as we sing together. Love divine. And then we're going to sing that, that new one uh, that you just heard. There is one gospel.
Let's pray together as we come uh, to God in worship. Let's, let's join together in prayer. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Lord, we come this morning to, to praise you with all our being. We come to worship you. We come to to thank you for that old story that rescued us, the story, the, the gospel story, the gospel truth of Jesus who gave his life that we might be redeemed. What wonderful news we have to, to sing about, to praise you for 
this morning. Lord, we've been singing about that gospel. We've been singing about your love for us. And Lord, it should fill our hearts with joy and wonder. Our highest joy and our our deepest need is you are God. Lord, as we come and, and praise you through our songs, as we come, uh, as we do uh, at this time to, to turn our hearts to you in prayer, uh, as we come uh, in a moment to, to celebrate this wonderful sacrament of baptism together, Father, as we hear your word, may we be so aware of, of your presence and your grace and your mercy and your goodness. And may we celebrate it together this morning. Lord, we come expectantly to hear from you, to be blessed by you. And so, Lord, we do come and pray that you would bless this short time we have together this morning. Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, will we know that you are here in all that we do. And as we worship you through all those different aspects of worship, Lord, we pray that we would know your blessing. Or we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So today we're going to celebrate uh, the sacrament of baptism uh, in a moment. And uh, this may be a little bit different of an order that, than you might be used to. Um, but we're going to begin the, the, this part of, of, of our service, the, the, the baptism, uh, by singing uh, together uh, the first three verses of, of a baptismal hymn, Father Filled with Thanks and Wonder. Uh, and during the singing of that, I'll come down to the front but let's stand and sing together our baptismal hymn father filled with thanks and wonder Have a seat for, for a moment. You, you can sit down too if you want. I don't. No point in standing when you're. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and rests upon those who fear God. And the Lord's righteousness extends to children's children, to all who keep the covenant and remember to do all the commandments. The Bible teaches that baptism is God's sign of salvation. It was the Lord Jesus who instructed us to baptize. Presbyterians believe that it is appropriate for Christian parents to have their child baptized because of God's covenant with Abraham. 
the sign of the covenant was given to Abraham and his children. And we believe that the promises of the covenant are extended to all true believers and to their children. Baptism does not mean that the child immediately becomes a Christian. Salvation is promised. In time, children must trust and believe in Jesus for themselves. Infant baptism is given on the basis of the parent's faith, not the child's. What is required of parents is a credible profession of faith. What that means is a profession accompanied by some understanding of the Christian faith and a lifestyle in accordance with Christian values and a public commitment to the worshipping Christian community. No minister or elder can see into the heart of someone else. They can only look at what is visible. But God knows our hearts intimately and is the, the ultimate judge of us all. And it's to him that we make our vows and promises in baptism, in membership, in marriage, all those vows that we make, we make to God who knows us intimately. And so, uh, this morning, I invite you, Wayne and Tracy, to declare your own faith and then to make your vows in the presence of God and before God's people in this place. The congregation, please stand. Okay. Firstly, to you as parents, in presenting Charlotte for baptism, are you affirming your belief in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and as your Lord, the Lord of your life? And depending on the grace of God, are you committed to living as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? Are you willing to provide a Christian home and bring up Charlotte in the worship and teaching of the church so that she may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Thank you. And now to us all as, as a congregation of God's people gathered here uh, this morning, I have a question for you as well. As we receive Charlotte into the fellowship of the church, do you promise with God's help to be faithful in prayer, spiritual nurture, Christian example and influence for Charlotte and for her family. Great, that's the right answer. Are you going to come over to me now, are you? Yeah? You coming over, Charlotte? Yeah. Come on over. Look at, look at me. Have a good look around you. Look, you're looking down that way now. You see everybody? We'll get, we'll get a wee walk around if you're settled enough in a wee minute. Look at them too. And they're looking at you as well. Aye. Oh, there we go. Huh? You're going to get upset? No, don't, don't, no, don't, 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 don't. Just lie back there a wee minute, yeah. Charlotte Theresa McCabe, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This child is now received, according to Christ's command, into the membership of the Holy, Apostolic, and Universal Church. Let's sing the ironic blessing together.
Let's pray for a moment together. Father, we do thank you for this sacrament that you've given us to welcome our children into your church. Father, we pray for, for Charlotte. We thank you for her. We thank you for her home. We pray that her home would be a place where your love is known, where you are honoured and obeyed. Father, we pray that as your people, we would so order our church life that we give her every opportunity to grow up in the knowledge and love of you, our great God. Father, help us as your people to support her and to support her family as they seek to bring her up in the faith. Father, we just pray your blessing on her today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, we're going to sing a couple, well, they're going to sing a couple of verses of the last couple of verses of the baptismal hymn, and you and I are going to go for a wee dander, so everybody can see how pretty you are. Let's sing together the second verses. One more for this way. You've all seen her now uh, as God's congregation here now. It's part of our promise, as we've just said, to, to help uh, Wayne and Tracy and to help uh, Charlotte and, of course, Arthur. Where's he hiding? <laughs> to provide a, a place uh, where she can grow up uh, amongst us. Uh, this is your church family now, Charlotte. The children may now leave for uh, Children's Church. And Christ, there's Christ as well, if you may. often say as part of our, our promise uh, to, to children as, as they are welcomed into our congregation is, is to provide all these organizations, our, our Sunday school, Bible class, all the youth organizations. And that's why we, the crash and children's church, that's why we encourage uh, each week, I try to encourage uh, parents to, to bring their children along to church. Uh, parents make promises at the front. Uh, we too as a congregation make promises and we trust that God will help us all uh, to fulfill uh, those vows. Let's continue uh, to worship God now as we bring our offering to him. Let's worship God together.
Let's pray together for a moment. Father, this too is our act of worship to you. A token of your blessing upon us. An acknowledgement from us how much we love you and give thanks to you for your goodness, for your grace, for the, the many blessings that we enjoy. Father, we pray that you would take this offering, that it would be blessed, and that it would be used to build your kingdom. Lord, we come just for a moment and turn our hearts to you in prayer as we think of all those who we know and love, all those circumstances in our family lives, in our community, in our church family, and in our community outside and across your world where your grace is so needed at this time. We continue to think of our royal family in this time of, of grief for them the loss of a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. And Lord, we know too that at this time of national grief, many have remembered the time of their own loss. Father, we pray that you be very near to them at this time to comfort and sustain all who miss loved ones. Lord, we pray for our church. We thank you for our church family, for those around us who help us to, to grow together in, in grace, for those who gather together to worship with us. Father, we pray that you would indeed continue to build your kingdom in this small part of your world. Lord, for all who are struggling in these days, we hear so much about this cost of living crisis. We know there are many who are finding times hard and difficult. Lord, we pray for those in authority who will attempt to do what is right. We, we hear about all that they're going to do, and Father, we just pray that you give them the wisdom and the guidance to do what is best for all. Father, most of all, we pray that we would know you are God, know you in our hearts, guiding us each and every day. We pray for those who we know who have yet to come to that knowledge and saving faith through Jesus. This great and wonderful gospel message that, that we have, that we celebrate. Father, we pray that many would come to know and to love the Saviour. We come in prayer. Our hearts turn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again uh, together as we come to think uh, about God's word. We're going to sing almost a prayer. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Let's stand and sing together.
going to read from God's Word again this morning. Uh, we're going to read uh, from Acts chapter 2, uh, following on. Uh, we're going to read the end, sort of the end verses of the chapter. Uh, but in Acts chapter 2, we see uh, almost the, the first account of the church gathering together. Uh, we have the day of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes and many are moved by, by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Peter uh, gets up uh, and addresses the crowd uh, and gives what really is a summary of, of the gospel. And calling people to come uh, to faith. And he, he finishes his, his section off with everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we find the people are convicted by Peter's sermon. And they become the church. And this is what happens after that. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The result, Scripture says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray for a moment as we come to think about God's Word. Father, as we've sang, we pray that you would speak to us from your word, that we would hear you, uh, most of all, that we would listen and obey, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The church is the dullest experience that we have in this country. I wonder what you think of that statement. The church is the dullest experience that we have in this country. Do you agree with Noel Edmonds who made the statement? I wonder what you think. Because many agree with Noel Edmonds. An American Writer Oliver Wendell Holmes, a very educated man, said, uh, I might even have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked so much like undertakers. For many, the church is the dullest experience we have in this country, or that's what they think. One of the most common things that we hear when we ask people why they don't come to church is just that. Oh, it's dull. It's boring. In the survey that, that I mentioned last week, many people talked about the service as being rigid, too formal, too ceremonial, with irrelevant music and relying too much on the tradition of a time and society that has long since passed. That's what people are saying. Society, and particularly television, seems to, to want to show Christians as either fanatical bigots or wimps who wouldn't harm a fly. Many perceive that, that churches meet in dusty old buildings and, and participate in some obscure ritual they call worship, which for, for many seems to involve nothing more than, than entering a building, singing a few hymns, and being asked to part with your hard-earned coffers to help keep the building from falling down. Many perceive that church is simply a club 
with three rules. Turn up, sing up, and cough up. How do we answer folk who think that that's what church is and won't engage because of that? How do we answer them? Perhaps we could start with an honest assessment of worship. Because church shouldn't be boring. It wasn't always that way and it doesn't have to be that way. The gathering of Christians for worship should be an exciting thing. The life of the church and its activities shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't be because we claim to have the best news imaginable. It's not some theory that that makes little or no difference to anything. But we have, have a message that we claim is just the kind of wonderful good news that all of humankind needs to hear. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like treasure, pearls of great value. That, that's what we have. And he talks about how when people discovered these treasures, they were filled with joy. As you read through the book of of Acts, you see the unfolding of of the early church. You see people who who responded to Jesus' challenge to follow him. And you see a life that is certainly not a boring one. Listen to Paul as he opens his letter to the Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In His love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Do those sound like words of someone who is bored? To me it sounds like someone who's excited and thrilled about the gospel message. If anyone had had suggested to Paul that that the celebration of this wonderful news might be dull, I'm sure he would have reacted in in absolute amazement. Boring? This? You can't be serious. I mean, he he goes on uh, in his letter to pray uh, for the readers. He he prays that they might, uh, I'm going to read from from the the message translation because I love the way the message translation puts this, what Paul prays for his readers. He prays that they might grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength. Does Paul seem bored? Christianity is exciting good news. This is a message that teaches about grace. It teaches about forgiveness. It's a message that deals with the the fundamental flaw that lies within the human heart. That messes up this world. It's a message that teaches about purpose and meaning. It talks about relationships. Teaches us about being loved. About being in a relationship and being loved by the living God. It's a message that that answers our deep need for love and fellowship. Does that not excite you? Because it should Isn't that a strange and terrible thing that we would make such great news seem 
boring. Nobody could have accused the early church of being boring. Those few verses that we read from Acts 2 give us a a picture of what the early church looked like to outsiders. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to to breaking of bread, to prayer. It talks about them sharing their, their possessions to care for each other. It talks about miracles happening. It talks about them meeting together daily in the temple courts with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God. And as they do that, they enjoy the favor of all people. And how the, their fellowship and witness draws people in and the Lord adds to their number daily those who are being saved. There was an excitement about church, an excitement about worship. Church wasn't like the dentist. Sorry, dentists. Um, Dentists, I suppose for me anyway, is somewhere you know you need to go to, but you don't really look forward to the prospect. Church isn't to be like that. Church was to be more of a celebration. A great banquet, actually, is the the words that Jesus uses to describe it. There was joy in the church, and it was evident to everyone around them. If people say that church is boring, it certainly wasn't in the beginning. Now that, of course, leaves us with some serious questions. What has changed? What have we done to worship? But how do we recapture the excitement of those early believers? How do we recapture an excitement that will be evident to those around us? Those who see something different when they look at the church. Now, of course, many churches have changed. Perhaps some of the the criticisms about boring church might perhaps be a a memory of, of how gloomy church was when they were young. Can we not invite them along? Show them that it's something different. Show them how how that's not true anymore. One author I read who commented on this issue said that sometimes we need to admit that the church looks more dead than alive, but that we should thank God that that's not the whole story. He said some churches do seem dead, but you should no more judge Christianity on this basis then you should imagine that because one cinema has closed down and become a bingo hall, that the whole film industry is dead. Of course, people might talk about bad experiences they've had of of boring worship. But that shouldn't let them judge Christianity on that basis. We should be more than ready to, to emphasize the positive Here's an interesting fact for you. If church is boring and dying, why are there more people in churches every Sunday than there are in all the country's football games on a Saturday? Do you believe me? Do you find that hard to believe? Actually, if you look up the figures, you'll find that still in these days, there's about seven times more people worshiping God than football. But actually, whether a worship service is boring or not, well, that really depends on the attitude of the people who attend. The attitude that people approach the church and worship services with. This is is relevant to all of us, not just to those who stay away thinking that worship 
is boring. It's relevant to all of us. If people go to church and expect or are perhaps determined to be bored, then bored they will be. They might even spend some time counting the panes in the windows. Maybe even try to count the number of bricks painted on the wall. I don't want the answer, by the way. We should encourage folk to approach church and worship with a real desire to find out more about this wonderful message, this message of Christ, and and come with expectancy to know his presence and to know his blessing. If worship is approached with a positive attitude, you might be surprised what we get out of worship. Of course, we don't come to get from God. But when we give ourselves and worship, we know the blessing and excitement of the great Savior we come to worship. If anyone comes to worship expecting to be excited, expecting to meet with Christ, committed to the one we worship, then things might not just be as stuffy and as boring as we might have expected. If we approach worship this way, if we come keen to meet with God and then celebrate this wonderful message, then we can encourage those who think church is boring to come. To come as we do and find the excitement and blessing of worship. Christian author David Watson wrote uh, in one of his books called I Believe in evangelism. He said that all too often people are not asking questions about God at all. They're simply apathetic. But when you begin to see ordinary men and women absorbed in something, excited about something, joyful about something, singing about something, then you naturally want to know what that something is. What do people see when they look at our worship? When we discover Christ, it's the greatest thing that we have. So it shouldn't leave us looking bored to the outsider. If we truly have this this great message, this, this gospel in our hearts then people should see see folk who are absorbed in worship. They should see people who are excited, joyfully singing. And they will really want to be part of the fellowship. They'll want to share in this this wonderful message of love and grace and forgiveness that, that has got us so excited This treasure that we have that should thrill our souls. Is church boring? Is it the dullest experience that we have? But another way, are you absorbed, excited, joyful? at the exciting message of the gospel that we have. Because if you are, you'll not be bored. Church? Boring? You've got to be kidding me. Let's pray together. Father, what a wonderful message we have. This gospel truth. This great saviour that we have. This wonderful message that, that Jesus stepped down into this world. 
to save us. He gave his life for us that we might know forgiveness, that we might experience your love and grace and your goodness. We might trust in him. Whether this wonderful message that we have should excite us, it should thrill our souls. Like the old hymn writer, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. As we truly know this message, this gospel message, we should not be bored. And others shouldn't look in and see us bored. Others, we get excited like that early church about, about Jesus. It will draw others in. Lord, we pray that you would excite us. That you remind us again of this wonderful gospel. And that as we get excited, again, like that early church, you would add to our number. Father, well, start in us and draw others to yourself. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Our final praise this morning encourages us to come with that attitude. Come, behold the wondrous mystery. Let's stand and sing together.
Let's pray together. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Lord, we have come to praise you and give you of our hearts. Lord, as we have sung your praise, as we've heard from this morning, we are, are blessed to be here together. We thank you for that wonderful message of the gospel. Father, we pray that you would part us with your blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both this day and forevermore. Amen.